Hello, and welcome to Differential Equations. In this video, we're going to talk about what a differential equation is and different classifications that will be useful this semester. For the class syllabus and the logistics of how the class will be run, you can consult the course webpage and the first day of classes. So what we want to talk about now is what is a differential equation. Well, a differential equation is an equation where the unknown is a function. And we're trying to figure out And what we are given is some relationship between the function and its derivatives. We call a differential equation an ordinary differential equation, abbreviated ODE. If the derivatives are taken with respect to only one variable. So for example, A really simple differential equation. If we just know that the derivative of y with respect to t is zero, well, then we know that y is a constant, right? Almost as simple if what we know is that the third derivative of y with respect to t is equal to zero, then we know that y is a polynomial of degree at most two, so we can write y as some constant c0 plus some constant c1 times t plus some constant c2 times t squared, right? Of course, most differential equations are not anywhere near this simple. We might have something like y plus take the first derivative of y with respect to t and square it, and then take the 11th derivative of y with respect to t and maybe that's equal to cosine t, right? So equations like this, we have no hope of being able to write down an explicit solution. But in each of these cases, the unknown is some function y, which is a function of t. These are all ordinary differential equations because we are only taking derivatives with respect to t. We call a differential equation a partial differential equation abbreviated 
PD. If the two derivatives are taken, with respect to more than one variable. So for example, let's say you have some function u and you know that it's derivative with respect to t is equal to second derivative of u with respect to x plus the second derivative of u with respect to y. This is an example of a heat equation. We'll talk about partial differential equations near the end of the semester. We're going to spend most of the semester talking about ordinary differential equations. Okay, so we have that division into ordinary and partial differential equations. We further classify differential equations by their order. The order of a differential equation is the order of the highest derivative which appears in the equation. So for example, if you have an equation that looks like dy dt to the fifth power plus sine of the derivative with y with respect to t plus the second derivative of y with respect to t is equal to e to t, then this is a second order differential equation. Because even though here you're taking the fifth power and here you're taking sine of this function, this you're only using the first derivative of y. Here you're only using the first derivative with respect to y. So this far, the equation would only be first order. Here you're taking two derivatives of y. And so the equation is second order. If we scroll back to these equations, then of course this equation is a first order differential equation. This equation is a third order differential equation. This equation is an 11th order differential equation. Notice over here, first order differential equation, and we ended up with one constant. Third order differential equation, and we ended up with three constants. That is not a coincidence. The order is generally equal to the number of constants that you have to specify in order to figure out a solution or in order to specify a solution uniquely, another way of thinking about that is that it's equal to the number of initial conditions. That are required to specify For example, if we had 
let's say we had that same differential equation, just knowing the third derivative is equal to zero. And let's say that we're also given that y of zero is equal to 17, derivative of y with respect to t at t equal to zero is equal to five, and the second derivative of y with respect to t at t equal to zero is equal to minus four, then we would know that y is not just some arbitrary polynomial of degree two, it is this polynomial of degree two, right? So as soon as you give me three initial conditions, then I can specify those three constants that we had in the general solution, right? And figure out a unique solution. A differential equation such as this one where all of the data is specified at one point is an initial value problem. If the data is specified at more than one point, then we say we have a boundary value problem. Another classification differential equations is into linear and nonlinear. A differential equation is linear if the dependent variable, so y in the previous example, and all of its derivatives enter into the equation linearly. The dependence on the independent variable right so t in the previous example does not have to be linear. So for example, if we had an equation like second derivative of u with respect to x plus e to the x times the third derivative of u with respect to y, equals sine of x, y, right? This is a linear third order partial differential equation, right? Because 
the derivatives of u enter into the equation linearly. On the other hand, if we had something like third derivative of y with respect to t plus y raised to the 27th power plus y times the derivative of y with respect to t equal to 5, then we would have a nonlinear third order ODE. Right? So here this is a PDE because we're taking derivatives both with respect to y and with x with and respect to y, whereas this is an ODE because all of the derivatives are with respect to t. This one is nonlinear. This term, the y enters nonlinearly. Also, this term, the y enters nonlinearly, the y and its derivatives. Right? If we only had this term, of course, it would be linear. And this, because it doesn't have anything to do with y or its derivatives, it doesn't matter. Uh, what it is. Similarly, this one term. Okay. We'll spend a lot of time studying linear equations, both because they are simpler, but also because in real life, when you are given something nonlinear, usually the thing you do first to try to understand it is look at linear approximations of it because those are much easier to understand, and they tell you a lot about the nonlinear. It's easy to write down the general form of a linear ODE. So the general nth order linear ODE As the form, well, we'd have some coefficient function depending on t times the nth derivative of y with respect to t, then some other coefficient function multiplying the n minus one derivative, and so on, until we have some coefficient function multiplying y itself, and then some other function of t. Right. When you have a, a linear equation written in this form, we say that this equation is homogeneous if the right-hand side is equal to zero, and non-homogeneous otherwise. It turns out that if you can solve the homogeneous equation, then you can solve the non-homogeneous equation. So usually when we study these, we'll focus first on the homogeneous version and try to find those solutions. Okay, so that's as far as we want to go in classifying differential equations for the moment. Let's talk about some examples. Well, for First example, if y represents, say, the position at time t, then, of course, dy dt represents the velocity at time t. And the second derivative of y with respect to t is the acceleration. 
So for example, if we set up a simple equation like second derivative of y with respect to t equal to minus g, when we think of an object falling solely under the force of gravity, then, well, this is a very simple equation to solve. You can just stare at it and see that the general solution would be minus g time over 2 times t squared plus some arbitrary polynomial of degree at most 1. And then you can find the constants, or you can find meaning for the constants. C1, you could interpret because it is dy dt at time zero, this is just the initial velocity. C zero is y at t equal to zero, this is just the initial height. Okay, so for a second um, set of examples, let's consider some growth, right? So the derivative with respect to t, if we think of t as time, it's the rate of change. So we could be thinking about the growth of, for example, y could be some sort of population. At time t. Well, a very simple assumption to make about population growth is that the population should grow proportional to its size, right? The more people you have, the more the population will grow, right? And grows proportional to size. So a simple way to model that would be to say, well, y prime is equal to some constant of proportionality times y. This, again, is a very simple equation to solve. We can just write down the solution. Right? For example, if, if k were equal to 1, then we'd be asking for a function whose derivative is that same function. right? And of course, the exponential is uh, a function that does that. And um, the general case, y prime equal to k times y, the solution is that y of t is some constant times e to the k times t. So this exponential growth or exponential decay is perhaps not, not too reasonable when you're thinking about, say, a human population because you eventually run out of resources, but this is really good for modeling radioactive decay. With say y equal to the mass of some material, some radioactive material. Another simple model for growth is that you might think that the growth should be proportional, not necessarily to the size of the population you're looking at, but to the difference with some external value. So here, for example, we might say that T is the temperature of somebody at time T. And we might want to compare that to what I'll call T naught, the ambient temperature. Right, so then Newton's law of cooling, 
says that the change in temperature is proportional to the difference between the temperature and the ambient temperature, right? So another very simple differential equation you can solve explicitly, right? This is a first order ODE. It's linear and uh, there is, as we would expect, one arbitrary constant in the general solution. But as long as this K of proportionality is positive, then we see that the temperature would decay exponentially until it reaches the ambient temperature and then stay there. Although, of course, uh, it would take an infinite time in this model for it to actually achieve that ambient temperature. Okay, a third thing you might do is suppose you're interested in population growth, but you want to be more realistic. And suppose we don't have unlimited resources. So then maybe what you want to consider both the current population call it P and the difference with the carrying capacity. That's it's called, which I'll denote P naught. So then a model that is known as the logistic model suggests that the change in the population should be proportional to both the current population and the difference, no, times the difference with the carrying capacity, right? Okay, this again is a simple differential equation. We'll, we'll talk soon about how to solve this, but for the moment, I'll just tell you the solution is in general an a function like this. So this one is a first order differential equation, right? Because we're only taking one derivative, but it's nonlinear because you can see here, if you were to multiply this out, you'd end up with a term with p squared, right? Um, over here in the general solution, notice that as expected, when you have a first order differential equation, the general solution has one arbitrary constant that you can't figure out from the equation. You would have to figure it out from some initial conditions. Okay. Um, why is this called logistic? That's a strange word you don't see in other contexts. Logistic is uh, the word that the person who proposed this model, a Belgian mathematician, Pierre-Francois Verhulst used in 1845 when he introduced it. It's, uh, it is a Greek word. It means uh, computation. And the reason he used it is he was using uh, logarithmic to describe what we would call exponential growth. And uh, so this was to, to compare it, to contrast it perhaps with logarithmic, he used logistic. So that's where that word comes from. Okay, so this shows some of the usefulness of differential equations because each model is talking about something, but the techniques of describing just the rate of growth and then figuring out what that implies about the function uh, 
doesn't care whether you you're thinking of your function as being the temperature of something or you're thinking of your function as being a population right it's it abstracts that away and just says if you want some relation between the rate of growth and your original function then this is what that implies right so these are some settings we'll see others as the semester goes on one closing thought I want to leave you with is that while solving a differential equation can be hard, but checking your solution is usually not hard. And so I encourage you to take advantage of that and check your solutions when you've solved an equation. So for example, here, this equation might be uh, a little hard, especially before we talk about how to do it to solve, but still it's an equation where, where you're only taking one derivative. So to check that something is a solution or not, you just have to differentiate this once and then plug in and do a little bit of algebra. So keep that in mind as the semester goes on. Okay, so one thing I will do throughout the semester is uh, I like to talk about history and other uh, context topics about how uh, things that are ne near to what we're talking about uh, that I think are cool and that you might enjoy hearing about. So uh, that's what I'm going to do now. I will talk a little bit about the historical context. Uh, specifically, let me tell you a little about Newton and Leibniz. However, this is not part of the course. So feel free to stop watching the video now and ignore what I'm about to say. Okay. So the historical context, well, the first and simplest differential equation is to try to find some function whose derivative is another function. Right? This is as simple a differential equation as you could hope to write down. And of course, we know the solution, right? The solution is, well, just integrate both sides with respect to t. Right, so solving a differential equation of this form is, is the same as like coming up with the notion of an integral and noticing that the integral is the opposite of the derivative, right? The inverse function to the derivative. While this had many precedents, we now attribute the discovery of calculus to Newton and Leibniz. So Isaac Newton, Right, born on Christmas Day, 1642, lived until 1727. So a little asterisk there for two reasons. One is that that's the same year that uh, Galileo died. And I've always found that really significant. It's like a, a passing of the baton or something from, from one great astronomer to another one great scientist to another. Uh, but also it's an asterisk because that um, it's 1642 with respect to the old calendar, the, the Julian calendar. Uh, once England caught up to the rest of Europe and switched over to the Gregorian calendar, which is a little after Newton died, uh, the dates got shifted. And so actually with respect to the Gregorian calendar, Newton was born in 1643. Uh, Newton was an English mathematician and one of the greatest scientists who's ever lived. Uh, what uh, some of us find comfort knowing is that he was not an outstanding student, 
it wasn't until after he finished his undergraduate degree that he started showing his genius, right? He was a student at Cambridge University in England. And in 1665, he stayed on to do his master's. And, and so in fact, he spent all of his academic career in Cambridge. In 1665, when he was working on his master's degree, there was a pandemic, right? Something we know a bit about from personal experience. It wasn't COVID, it was bubonic plagues. And uh, they closed the university for two years. Uh, to top it off, during that same period in 1666, there was what's known as the Great Fire of London. So the, the uh, English were having really bad couple of years. Now, since they did not have Zoom, uh, Newton spent his time deep in thought and had what is uh, sometimes called his Anus Mirabilis, right, in 1666, which is just a fancy way of saying an amazing year, right? During that year, he developed his first draft of the theory of calculus. He made huge advances in optics. In fact, he, he's the one who noticed that uh, white light is not the absence of color. It is the uh, a mixture of all of the colors. And he worked on his theory of gravity. Right? In fact, he refined his theory su sufficiently uh, to convince himself that uh, Earth's gravity holds the moon in motion. All of that before the age of 25. So while many of the pieces of what we consider calculus were put together by others, for example, Newton's own teacher, a guy called Isaac Barrow, uh, had proved the geometric version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It was Newton and Leibniz who uh, developed and systematized the theory to the, the extent that we now credit them with discovering calculus, right? For Newton, calculus was what allowed his calculations in his physical investigations, right? So notice the, the not coincidental um, words calculus and calculations, right? That's why we call it calculus Calculus means stone or pebble in Greek, and it refers to using, say, an abacus to do computations. Uh, so uh, calculus re referred to anything you used to make calculations. And um, after Newton and Leibniz, what they came up with was so useful for doing computations that we just call it now the calculus. For Newton, it allowed him, for example, to show that his law of universal gravitation implied that the planets move in elliptic orbits and explained three laws that the German astronomer Johannes Kepler had noticed through meticulous observations. So Kepler just had tons of data and he studied the data and noticed three things that always happened, which he called his laws. And then Newton was able to show that these were, were implied by his, his model. So it gave the model a ton of credence. And um, it really showed how strong calculus was, although Newton did not publish uh, the calculus when he published his findings in, in astronomy. He... Uh, he used calculus to discover his results, but not to present them. Newton finished his studies at Cambridge, and then he ended up becoming a professor when his professor, Isaac Barrow, uh, left to become chaplain to the king. This would be Charles II in 1669, and Newton got promoted to professor, a special type of professor known as the Lucasian chair. In 1685, uh, Charles II was succeeded by his brother, James II. 
Uh, James II was a Catholic, and um, as you know, the the English monarchy had had problems with the Catholic Church. Right during the whole uh, reign of Henry VIII and then his kids. Uh, so it was a big deal that James II was a Catholic. Uh, Newton and basically everybody at Cambridge was pro were Protestant. And uh, there was some controversy with uh, James wanting uh, to, to install Catholic professors. And Newton became embroiled in some political defense of the university. And this led to him being elected to parliament where he worked with the majority of parliament to offer the crown to somebody else. So this, this led to the what's known as the Glorious Revolution. And James II was replaced by his sister, Mary II, who was Protestant, and her husband, William III. Newton ended up leaving Cambridge uh, a few years later to take up a government position at the Mint, the Royal Mint, and essentially stopped doing research. The last portion of his life was dominated by a controversy over who had inv invented calculus, him or Leibniz. So this is Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. Uh, who was around from 1646 to 1716. So I put the Vaughan in parentheses because Vaughan is used to denote nobility. And um, Leibniz was not noble, but he just at some point started calling himself Vaughan Leibniz and some people went along with it. Leibniz was a German genius who was interested in everything. He's famous not just in the history of math, but he's really famous also in the history of philosophy. He, he did a lot beyond inventing calculus. He worked a lot on binary, for example. He didn't invent it, but he developed it a lot. And uh, he, he thought it had a lot of metaphysical importance that you could set up all of the numbers using just zero and one. He thought this showed that all you needed was you know, zero, which is nothing, and then one, which he thought represented God. So as long as you had zero and God, then you could do everything. But uh, anyway, he also uh, constructed like a primitive uh, mechanical calculator. Uh, what was special about it compared to previous um, attempts was that he figured out how to get it to do multiplication and division, as well as addition and subtraction. And he worked a lot as a diplomat. Uh, you know, as opposed to like Newton, who spent all of his time, his academic time at a university and worked as a professor. Leibniz, in his study, tried to come up with like global systems that would encompass all of human knowledge. As a philosopher, he's perhaps best known for his optimism. He claimed that the, the world we live in is the best of all possible worlds. So you'd think that this would be a really hard position to defend because you know lots of bad things happen. His explanation for things like natural disasters was that, well, sure, bad things happen, but to avoid them, God would have had to create the world with different physical laws, and that would have led to a worse world. And so bad things happen, but nevertheless, what we have is the best of all possible worlds. Uh, Leibniz didn't study math or natural science as it would have been then. He studied law and philosophy. He got a doctorate in philosophy. And when he finished, he worked for a German baron, uh, von Boinberg. And he worked for this guy as his secretary, his assistant, his librarian his lawyer, his advisor, and a uh, wandering diplomat. Uh, as part of that, uh, the Baron sent him to, uh, to France and later England as a peace mission. So back then, Louis XIV was king of France and, and was really into war. So uh, he went as part of a peace mission to try to convince uh, Louis XIV not to attack 
parts of Germany. Of course, Germany as, as a country didn't exist back then, but parts of what are now Germany. So he ended up in Paris in 1672, where he spent some of his free time, because being a diplomat involved back then a lot of free time where you're waiting for uh, the king and his court to have time to talk to you. So he spent his free time studying mathematics with a, with a famous Dutch mathematician, Christian Huygens. Uh, we'll mention Huygens again later and some of the things he did, uh, some of the really cool math he did when thinking about how to construct clocks. But in any case, at this point, Huygens is important because he was the person who taught uh, math to Leibniz. During this time in Paris, Leibniz started to develop his ideas about calculus. And as part of that, he spent a lot of time thinking about good notation. This is in stark contrast to Newton. Uh, Newton used calculus basically just for his own computations. And so he just used whatever notation he came up with at the time and didn't put too much thought into it. And his notations were actually really pay, pretty terrible. Whereas Leibniz was great in notation. Uh, he also made a couple of trips to London, which is interesting because of the controversy that later arose about who invented calculus. But he ended up returning to Germany in 1676 because the baron that he was working for had died and he needed to find somebody else to help pay the bills. He uh, found uh, work with the Duke of Hanover and uh, worked for uh, them the rest of his life mostly as a librarian, although the Duke also had him work on things like um, uh, genealogical trees, right? Of course, that's, that's a, a hobby for a lot of people these days, but, but when you're working with the nobility, it can be really important for, for um, inheritance to know exactly who you're related to. So that was important work, but far from math. Um, anyway, Leibniz published his theory of calculus in like 1684, uh, differential calculus and integral calculus a couple years later. Newton's book, uh, The Principia, uh, appeared uh, a year after that, so 1687. But he had written his theory of calculus, what Newton called the theory of fluxions, in 1671 so many years before Leibniz. However, although Newton wrote it down, he didn't get it published. It just got circulated around by Newton's friends. So it's now known that uh, Newton and Leibniz developed their theories independently of each other. They both came up with calculus. Uh, but at the time, there was a long controversy with Newton claiming that uh, Leibniz had plagiarized his ideas and uh, that these, these uh, friends who had been circulating the manuscript, that somehow Leibniz had, had gotten a look at it and had, uh, was just pretending to have come up with the ideas on his own. Uh, Newton, at this point, was um, head of the Royal Society in, in England. And so he could, um, he used that a lot to his advantage in, in this controversy. Uh, this led to a big split between science in uh, England and science in the rest of Europe because uh, English mathematicians uh, took Newton's side and European mathematicians took Leibniz's side. And um, anyway, it's, a, it, it's really sad that this happened and that uh, these two geniuses spent so much of their time uh, embroiled in that controversy. Uh, let's talk a little about the notation that Leibniz is very justly famous for. So Leibniz introduced, uh, among other things, the notation uh, for the integral. This is um, because for Leibniz, uh, the integral was like an infinite sum. And this is how Leibniz wrote his S. And so what we have is just a fancy S standing for sum that we use for the integral. Um, Newton didn't think of the integral as, a, as an infinite sum. He, he thought of the integral as just the, the inverse of the derivative, which you might call an antiderivative. Uh, Leibniz also introduced the notation we use for derivatives. Uh, 
right? D by DT or DY by DT. Um, and for that matter, notation uh, DY for derivative of Y. Um, so these are great and we use them all the time and they're definitely better than, than anything Newton came up with. He also came up with some notation we don't use. Uh, for example, Leibniz did not use the equal sign that we use. Instead of the equal sign, he used uh, like a pi, which was meant to represent like a balance, right? So, you know, the sort of thing where you have, um, you know, maybe something hanging over here and something hanging over here, right? And so you're like balancing the two sides of, of uh, an expression. And if they're perfectly balanced, then, um, then you have something like this. Uh, what uh, Leibniz would do for an inequality, right? So instead of, so pi instead of equal sign. And then if you did this, but say the left leg was longer than this, meant that the expression on the left was larger than the expression on the right. So this would he would use for greater than. And of course, if you want less than, then you make this leg longer. Uh, so while that's really cute, um, this would be a problem for people like me who have messy handwriting, where you might not know whether you meant to make that leg longer than the other one and it didn't catch on. Another thing he would do that didn't catch on is instead of doing uh, parentheses, uh, he would just put a line over the expression that um, that would be in parentheses. So, so instead of, uh, say, uh, if he wrote two, three plus five, and then put a parentheses like this, this would be what we would write as two parentheses, three plus five. Right. Um, also, even the notation that did catch on, we use it a little differently. For for Leibniz, the the integral, he it's sort of like how we do square root these days, right? So where we have the square root of uh, some expression, say forty nine or something, and we put all of it underneath that bar. That's what he would do with the integral sign. So what we would write today as the integral of x dx he would have written as something like this, right? So his S uh, included uh, some overbar. So the notation he used, we don't use it the same way he did, but still it's, uh, it's wonderful notation uh, that, uh, that's also very suggestive of, of things. So anyway, that's uh, Newton Leibniz. And I will see you all next time.